what I'm going to do is is first of all just um, introduce the the sort of area we'll be covering, and then um, our, and co colleague Shanali will take us through some of the demonstration of the site to of the platform, so you can get familiar with it. Okay, so what we're going to do first is look at where we how we got here, um, a bit of an update of where we're at at the moment. Then we'll have a little bit of demonstration of what the platform looks like. We'll talk about early access. I think many of you have put your signed up for early access and we'll just explain a little bit about what that will involve. We'll, we'll talk about the pilot courses. I saw some names of people here who I know have put themselves forward to be pilot courses and we'll just explain how that's going to work. And then a little bit on the migration uh, planning timeline, um, but that won't, it'll be towards the end. And then we'll, if we still haven't covered all the questions, we'll have a, a Q and A um, space. So I'm relying on Shanali to look at the chat because I'm seeing full screen here, Shanali. So if you need to stop me, please do that. We'll Otherwise, do. I'm going to get going. Voice. Thank you. Okay. So just to just as a heads up, we won't be covering these topics today, which is the short courses and how they can be accommodated on uh, Brightspace. But that is an area we are investigating, and we'll make sure that there's sessions about this. Uh, in the coming few months. So if you have interest or concerns about that, we won't be covering it in this in this particular webinar, but you'll hear from us about this further. We are looking at the affordances for short courses in the Brightspace platform. We're also not going to discuss non-course migration. So we all know that Vula has become, become widely used for a whole variety of types of um, you know, functionality that, that's not included in teaching. And we will be looking at solutions for all of those. But similarly, we're not going to prioritize that because we feel it's more important to focus on the teaching and the course sites. So there's Villa's not going any going any going away at any time soon. So all your research sites or your project sites and so on are, are, can just continue as they are until there is um, until we get around get to looking at the particular solutions for non courses for courses that I mean for sites that are non courses. Okay, so that's just a disclaimer, not in this presentation. Okay, so just a, a quick recap. Some of you would know all of this already, but for those of you who haven't been to any of the other earlier sessions. Um, this decision came out of a quite a long process called the Learning Platforms Update Project, L L LPUP, which was set up to look at uh, UCT's future needs around teaching and learning for the next 10 years or so, linked to the Vision 2030. And out of that investigation, there was um, a sort of a process of evaluating learning platforms. And finally, a decision was made after that evaluation process that Brightspace was the platform that would be best suited to our needs. I think there were people in this room who were part of the, uh, you know, giving input about that during during last year. So the decision is that we will migrate courses from Vula to Brightspace over several years, likely concluding by the end of December 2024 and having most or all courses on Brightspace by 2025. Um, while this is the main focus of today's session, LPUP will also look at course evaluations, online assessment tools, and virtual meeting solutions at, as part of this overall ecosystem that we're looking to develop for our future. Okay, so just I wanted you to see we're in a long journey here, and um, we're at the very, very beginning of the journey. So you'll see that the that we actually only sort of signed off and had an agreement about our new platform at the end of January. So we're underway with a whole series of work, which some of it is going to be running concurrently. And um, for instance, things like the technical um, configuration, the tools integration landscape, and looking at the orientation and training that uh, Silton ICTS needs so that we're up to speed to support everybody. Those things are are really fully underway, as well as a planning process, planning the process, process for migration with faculties that's happening currently. We're also looking at the teaching and learning needs around the course site template design and tools, um, which is really very important when we, when we do the migration of courses and moving the content across. And we're also involved in setting up training and development and materials for the training around Brightspace. So these are, if you see all these individual blocks are all pieces of work that we're busy with. 
And um, but today's presentation is going to focus there on the pilot courses and the early access. So you'll see we, if you look at this uh, this particular strand of work, which is the migration itself, we've got we're in kind of this early phases of we in consultations with the faculties about what their particular needs are and any issues that we need to take into account, and looking at what would suit the students and staff in terms of the phases of migration. On the large scale, we're also involved in now setting up the platform ready for early access so people can get a, get to play around with the, the sandbox sites. And we're also at the moment identifying pilot courses that will run live in 20 in the second semester of this year, so that we can um, see how things when how it works and make it small adjustments as we go along and get ready for the, the large scale migration, which will be um, sequence, it won't be all at once. So um, this, this is where we, we're at. And this, this is a, we're in really the prepar preparatory phases at the moment. So that we've been, we're still busy talking to faculties about the best way it'll suit them and students to do the phasing of the migration. And we've now moving to the second phase of preparation, which is to identify pilot courses and to allow early access to the platform. And this is long before we actually begin any full migration. So we'll start looking at work on full migration from the second semester, but um, that's still quite a way off. So just to get some sense of this, the, the, the big bubble there is the migration of all VULA courses. And we're busy with these little early starter bits of our journey, which is early access and the pilot courses. So I'm going to stop there um, for now. And Shnali, do you want to tell me if there are questions we should take here or if you'd like to uh, jump into the demonstration? I think we've responded to questions in the text chat, but I just want to check at this point, does anyone have any specific questions about what Janet has said so far that you would like to unmute briefly and raise? I am not, Janet, seeing any unmutes, nor am I seeing hands up. Uh, Richard. Thank you very much. I just, I just wanted, when we talk about pilot courses uh, and the migration, is there kind of any doubt whatsoever that, that there are going to be sort of any significant teething problems um, that, that, that we might experience? Because what I'm trying to do by actually coming up, by, by, by taking part in the pilot scheme is we're developing a brand new course and we don't want to have to develop it, put it on Vula and then, and then migrate it later. So sort of do double the work. And I just wondered about the level of confidence that, that, that UCT has that this um, trial phase of, of, of small short of, of, of at least pilot courses. Um, I'm sure it'll have its, its dose of teething problems, but it's not going to, I presume the system has been used very well elsewhere. And so we're confident that it, that, that we're able to launch course code type courses this year. Thanks very much. Yes, thanks for the question, Richard. And I did see your course put forward. I think it makes absolute sense that you develop the new course on the new platform because that would just be a waste of time to develop a course and then have to do that all over again. So I was really pleased to see that coming forward as a pilot. And yes, I think we've got real confidence that it will be effective. And the platform, as you said, we're not saying there won't be little glitches, but I think we feel fully confident that it'll that is perfectly adequate and will be a good experience. Um, it's been used widely. It's a very leading platform internationally. And we've been in quite a, a lot of conversations with colleagues from universities across the world who have migrated onto Brightspace. And that includes uh, Delft University, New York State University. I don't know, there's a whole list of them, Rhode Island, lots of them. And people are pretty happy with the platform. It's really been put through its paces in other places. It's not like a new, you know, unknown, untested platform at all. So please don't be concerned about that. And we will be giving special support to the pilot courses. But as you say, of course, there will be things that don't go quite according to plan, but I'm very confident we'll be able to problem solve as we go along. Oh, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Richard. Um, last chance, folks, for any questions about the process that we're currently in, in terms of the pilot, primarily the kind of big picture process. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions uh, or hands up. 
So Janet, if it's okay, I'm going to steal screen and do a little demo. Yep, perfect. Um, colleagues, I am going to keep one of my screens, hopefully, um, with um, Zoom uh, questions and so um, text chat up on it. So please, can I invite you to do two things for me? If at any point you have a question, please feel free to raise it in the text chat. Um, alternatively, you can also just please put up a hand or unmute and 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 sort of cough at me or say my name, and I will I will pause what I'm doing and we can talk about where it is, because with a with a demo, I don't want you to wait till the end to ask your question. So, at the moment, when I log into, so on your screen at the moment, you should be seeing a Brightspace page. When I log in to my, my account at the moment, this is what I see. I am currently on my landing page, the very first page that I will see for Brightspace. A um, couple of things to just alert you to. Um, over here, we have all our different courses, and you'll see that I am on a number of courses at the moment. Um, that's just because a number of SILT people are making and playing around with courses in the background. When you get onto this, you will probably see simply one, one thing on here, maybe two things on here. You are likely to see your own sandbox. And my sandbox has dropped all the way to the bottom because I think it was probably one of the first courses. Um, the second thing that you will see is that you will see probably a demo site of some kind on here. So when you get your access to Brightspace, you will probably have two, maybe at the most three courses up here initially. What you will not have when you first got get on here is you will not have access to your formal UCT course. So if, for example, you teach EEE 1007, you will not, if you are an early adopter or if you are a pilot, you will not, when you first get access, see that on here. So don't panic if you get on there and you don't see your course immediately. Over here, you have a little widget that says getting started to Brightspace, with Brightspace, and that will take you to a couple of very useful spaces. It'll take you to um, Brightspace help information for both learners and staff, and this widget looks the same for, for staff and learners. Announcements that pertain to all of your courses will pitch up here. We'll show on this page. There'll be some information about the Brightspace community. So if you've got general questions about Brightspace, that will arrive here. And this is a really, really interesting and cool new tool for staff. If you have marking assessment as a staff person, it will pitch up on this quick eval widget. So if your students have recently submitted something that you have tagged as a gradable item, it will show on this very front page. Um, and then, of course, there is a reminder. Um, I see that there's quite a lot of conversation happening in the chat, but I don't think it's in regards to the demo. If you have a demo question, just please unmute and, and ask away. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you two things today in terms of the a bright space space. I'm going to show you what a course looks like, and then I'm going to show you what that course looks like from an instructor perspective. Let's start by looking at it from what it looks like from a learner perspective. So this is a little demo course that was kindly shared with us by the bright space um, trainers. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of what that looks like. So we are now in a course called Brightspace Learner Simulation. And you'll see that it greets me by name. Um, in this instance, it's thinking of me as a student in the course, which is absolutely fine. It gives me a little orientation checklist, which we can build in. Um, again, a calendar, it would have specific work to do here. So if as part of the Brightspace Learner Simulation course, I had some kind of assignment, it would show here immediately. So I would not lose track of my deadlines. 
and it tells me who my educator for the course is over here and of course this is customizable by the particular lecturer involved in the course if you prefer you could make this um, a team element of course so these are the modules or the topics or the weeks, whatever you would prefer to call them in the course. And I would like to show you what that looks like. This little welcome one is very short. It's only two topics. So I'm going to do a quick fly through of that. And it's quite nice because it allows students to immerse themselves. Once you click on that little content tab, that little module, it takes you into this immersion view. And for students to uh, Ramona's question, anything showing on the to-do list means it was input by someone, i.e. E. course can be no lecturer. Exactly. So it's not, um, the to-do list is not controlled by students. It's controlled by the course structure. So if a lecturer says you've got a tech to, to do this week, a discussion contribution, and don't forget your assignment for week three, that would appear in your to-do list. Okay. So that's what you, that's kind of a little welcome element. Um, you can give students, you can embed something on it. Please excuse the bright orange. That's a reminder to us that we're in a kind of working space. Um, Shinali, there's a hand. Oh, there's a hand. Wahida, go for it. Thank you, Hi, Janet. Thanks, thanks Shinali. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to ask a very quick question about the assignments. Um, mm. uh, have in, in the previous um, slide. So uh, how, would, how would that come up? Would I, as a lecturer, have to um, uh, uh, input the information for, for, for it to come up on the student side that there's an assignment due? Or does the well, student have to make that uh, input in for, for the diary? Her, her so wins? Brightspace will take it off the when you build the assignment. Brightspace will pull that data from the assignment into the to-do list. Okay, thanks. So it builds it for you. Um, does the to-do list relate to one course or across all the courses? Cheryl, when I'm in the course, it relates to that one course. When I am at the, the institution level, so when I first log on, then if there's a to-do list on that page, it would relate to multiple courses. And that's something we would have to look at as to whether we put to-do lists in multiple places. Okay, so this was, I said, just a little introduction module. I see Shana, another voice. Uh, Shanadi, there's a yeah. question from Warren there about uh, customizing can the layout. Can I customize? Of the... Okay, thank you, Warren. So can you customize the layout of, I'm just gonna skip back a pace. Can you customize the layout of this? That is one of the things that is currently under discussion. There will be some elements that are customizable, but some elements that are common in order to make sure that students don't have wildly unfamiliar experiences across the eight to 10 courses they might land up with in a year. Okay, so we had a quick look at what was that. It's just it's a uh, module one. It's just some very basic sort of um, elements. Module two is more interesting. It has some text on an HTML page. Don't panic about the word HTML page. You can um, we have templates for you to support that. What is nice here is that for students who find dipping into and out of things confusing, this kind of keeps them on track. Um, I want to show you some of the other things that you can embed. So you can embed slightly more extensive content on the page if you wish. Students can download or print this. Some other things that you can embed, very common items that we all want to embed in our courses. We might want to embed, for example, um, a, yes, Richard, it is, um, within some constraints. Um, you might want to embed, I think this was simply a set of slides, so you can embed um, slides of various kinds. It is indeed, Rebecca, possible to embed both video and audio. Again, this is a text example. Here's an example of an embed, which is just an image. I think that somewhere along the line, we have an example of a video that I want to get to. So this is an instruction for um, 
for the student that something is going to have to happen next. We want a bit more text on this page and we'll build that in for you. But here's the thing they have to do. They have to do a quiz. Now I've done this quiz a couple of times before, so I'm not going to do it again. Um, actually, let me do it again. It's only three questions, then you all can see it very quickly. And I'm going to make totally random choices here. Next page. And I need to finish this. Okay. The thing I promised I wouldn't do. And then I would submit my quiz. And it gives students an opportunity to say submit yes or no. And it's done. Okay, so it's my third attempt and it will tell you what's happening. So my first attempt, I got that. The second attempt, my instructor hasn't, thank you, Janet. The second attempt, my instructor hasn't marked yet, nor have they marked my third attempt because they have to, two elements of it are marked and the third are automatically marked and the third element must be marked by the instructor. So at the risk of confusing everybody terribly, I am going to swap screens for a second and I'm going to open up my instructor view. Okay, so this is again when the person lands up when as an instructor, so this is a training instructor, when an instructor arrives at University of Cape Town, i.e. when a lecturer arrives at their particular course site, you will see if I scroll down that there are things that I should be marking. Okay, there's a little oopsie things for me to do. And maybe I would go and click on these directly for the quick eval, or maybe I want to go into my course itself and work from there. So if I go into my course itself, you will see some similar elements. You will see that, for example, the table of contents, the kind of visual table of contents is there. Okay, you will also see that underneath that, the quick eval tool for this course is here. So I could go and evaluate something. So if I wanted to go and evaluate that quiz, for example, let's go and click on that so that you can see what it looks like. And you will be able to see that various people have tried the quiz. I'm gonna scroll very quickly to Shanali's and see if I can mark her attempt. And I can simply grade through this, okay? I'm not going to get stuck into the actual grading element of it right now though. Okay, um, let's go back a step and take you back into, I hope, student view. Uh, that's back to my apologies, folks. Uh, when you are being both student and staff, it can be a little bit confusing some days. Um, so let's make sure that I get back to my student view. Yeah, so I'm back in my student self. Okay. Um, so in terms of student view, I think the other key things to take away from this is that you can, in the same way that you could, as a student, see any of the elements that you would expect to see in a, le in a lesson. You could see text embedded, you could see docs embedded, you could see video audio, et cetera, all of those things are there. Janet, are there any questions in the text chat that I need to pick up on? I see Wahida has a hand up. Yes, and somebody also asked about grade books. So, okay. Ali, that's an old hand, I'll take it Is down. it an old hand? Okay. So let's pop into back into staff view if people have a question about grade book. The short answer about grade book is, is there definitely grade book? Yes, there is. Um, and it's a slightly different tool. It's a tool called Grades. Um, and if I go up to the top of my nav bar and I click on Grades, you will see that was us messing around 
in the last session. And you can enter grades, manage grades, you can have various ways to structure the gradebook. We're not going to get into that in detail here. For today, all we're doing is giving you a little bit of insight into what it looks like and that actually in many ways it's not a wildly unfamiliar character it does look less clunky and in many in many ways michelle i think that's an important that's what i would like to say about my experience of trying to learn brightspace so far is that there's a lot of overlap of functionality but there is a lot more ease in terms of doing things so, for example, if I wanted to add a module, I would click on content, and I'm not going to demo this fully. You would click on content, and then I would simply add a new unit. Okay, and if I added a new unit, um, I could create something new in that unit, and so on and so forth. Let me pull up my sandbox site so that I can do things on it without breaking stuff for the lovely Brightspace people. I don't want to break their site. I just wanted to show you what the staff end of it looked like. Okay, can I show you the course analytics in the lecture review? Um, Patricia, the, the course analytics in Brightspace are a lot easier to use. I don't want to show it to you now because the courses are not, most of these courses have just a designer on them and a designer in learner view. So the analytics is very limited. Once we start our training, we will have slightly more populated courses with more people in learner roles. So the analytics will look a little bit easier. Um, okay. Uh, special fonts into the text editors to display symbols. Meryl, I'm going to ask someone in our text chat if anybody in the text chat has a clear and definite answer to that I would love to hear I am not 100% certain on that can I log onto Brightspace as a student apart from changing the view i.e creating a profile Ramona you would have to have a an alternate email that was a student role and that is something that we do sometimes do in order to make testing possible. Okay. Um, how do I change the order of lessons in, oh, sorry, Patricia, we'll come back to you on that. Um, in Brightspace, one of the things that is nice, uh, that's the wrong one to go into. Let's go into one that I can destroy without causing chaos. Janet, just one more minute here, and then we'll move on to other things, if that's okay. So in Brightspace, if I want to move things, I can simply, let's say I want to swap these two modules around, I can click and drag, which is nice. Um, there are, there is, it is a click and drag system as opposed to reordering on a menu. And that is, that's the kind of level of functionality that I think that they do incredibly well. It will save you many, many seconds that will aggregate to many, many hours. Um, Nicole is asking about the icons next to my login name. Okay, so up here at the top, those are your, uh, if you have messages from the system, you'll get them there. So I completed a task and I get a little, you nailed it award, which is rather nice. Um, and these are when elements are added to grades and so on, you get a notification. So that's email or instant messaging and then two types of notification. Yes, Warren, you can create badges and awards. We're not sure if that's gonna be open immediately to the pilot group but that is something that will happen in future spaces. There are functions like discussions or forums up at the top here. You add, this is where you add your content to your course. This is where you would add any kinds of assignments to your course. Assignments tool is very, very similar to, it's not radically different if you've used assignments in Vula, it does many of the same things just with a little, a lot more ease discussions that show people what that looks like 
And again, this is a very unpopulated course, so it's not going to look great, but you simply can add topics, you can group by sections, you can allow students to subscribe to discussions. And there was a question about stats earlier. You can look at the statistics in the discussions tool. So if I clicked on this and if I had people in this course, I could immediately show you the statistics for that. And that in many ways is a particularly nice element. So can you assess discussions? Yes, Elanka, you definitely can. So this is um, from an instructor view from a course that does have some humans in it. So if I click on statistics, it tells me these things. If I want to search for a particular learner, what was Shanali doing this particular day? You can see what she did. And if I clicked on her name, I would go to her specific um, posts. I could see what she was doing in specific posts. So it kind of gives you a bit of an overview of what that person was up to. Like she read a fair number, she replied to a couple and she posted once as instructed. Okay, I think we must pause with demo there. Um, but I would like to just say that, in, and we're going to show you something about tools overviews, I think. Um, can you integrate external tools? Yes, Meryl, we'll talk about some of the integrations that are already in place. And we'll talk about the possibility of additional um, integrations as well. I'd love to hear if you have a specific tool in mind. Janet, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Do you mind resharing slides? No problem. And thank you so much for that, Shanali. I think it gave people a really good uh, sort of taster for what it looks like. And we will be there'll be plenty more opportunities. Um, we will be running more webinars yes. on the details and so on. And you'll, you know, we'll there'll be plenty more chances to explore. We just wanted you to get a sense because everyone's been saying, what does it look like? And we're we'll keen for you to see. Yeah. So we'll we're back at so I'm very happy for that. Thank you, Shanali. And it, yeah. I think it is pretty exciting looking. So I'm glad you like the look of it. I'm just going to go to the next slide for you to carry on with your mm -hmm. section here. Thank you. Oops. No problem. So folks, the next two slides are just a very quick mapping. Uh, we will send you the slides after today's session. The thing I want you to take away from this is in the left hand column, you will see there the Sakai tools in the middle orange column, you will see that there are the um, the Brightspace equivalent, Ruben, yes. Um, and then in the right hand column, you will see kind of the role of the tool, what the tool does, the function. Um, and for every Sakai tool that we have used in the past, there is a Brightspace equivalent um, that we will continue to use. And that's true for all the tools that we have. Okay, so just to be aware that there are equivalents, they may not be exactly the same, they might require a slightly different approach, but they do have a good equivalency between the two and you'll be able to look, look at that in detail. Um, Janet, do you want to take us on to the next? Um, Right, thank you. So in terms of Brightspace and tools, what we've tried to do, and this is how the training will work to some extent, is that we will group tools. So there are various tools in Brightspace that focus on building, building course content. So uh, the equivalent of thinking about um, uh, building a lesson, for example, in Fula. So We'll have a set of sessions around different kinds of course content issues, how to manage your files, how to add new content, what the templates do, how to create assignments, quizzes, and discussions, how to build new course material onto the actual site. So there'll be a cluster of tools that support that and obviously training and support around those. Brightspace has a very nice cluster of communications tools which relate to creating announcements, managing groups, creating and moderating discussions, analytics, and intelligent agents, which allow you to communicate with selected groups of students based on behavior. So if somebody doesn't show up in your course site by the end of week one, let's say a whole lot of somebody's, you can send them individually a message that goes, hi, Shanali, I noticed that you haven't made it to the course site um, by the end of the first week. Would you like some is there somewhere I can help you get there, for example? 
Then there are a cluster of assessment tools, including the assignments tool, the rubric school tool, the discussions tool, the quizzes tool, and one that seems to have rolled off the bottom of my screen for some reason. Um, I apologize, I'm not quite sure where that's gone. Um, probably, mm, let's not worry about what it is. There is another assessment tool off the bottom there. And then there are tools with which we are already familiar tools that we have been using in relation to Vula for a very long time. Um, Turnitin, Gradescope, WooCap, Padlet, that list on the right-hand side there. And those tools are all in the process of either, all those tools have either already been integrated into the UCT instance of Brightspace or are in the process of being integrated into the UCT instance of Brightspace. So, those tools will not disappear from the ecology just because we have changed learning platforms. Thank you. Janet, next slide. Um, so there are a whole lot of things that we're excited about. Um, the contemporary architecture, it just looks a lot better. The core structure is, I think, a lot easier to build into in many ways. There are some very exciting responsive media options. I discovered, for example, the other day that you can add a 30 minute, good Lord, 30 minute voice note at the end of a rubric if you wanted to do that. You can add a 30 minute video at the end of a rubric if you wanted to do that. I would not suggest 30 minutes of that. Um, you can send an announcement with a video or voice note in it directly recorded from inside Brightspace. So rather than going off somewhere, recording, importing, exporting, none of that, you do it inside the um, platform itself, which I think is fantastic and I'm very excited to play with. Better functionality across devices, um, notifications for students to multiple devices, really, really strong elements uh, around accessibility, making, um, making things accessible in different ways for students with perhaps um, vision problems or hearing problems. And then of course the front page widgets. Um, and I would like to encourage um, people who've been playing on Brightspace already, still folks, if you would like to pop into the text chat something that you are excited about with a little star at the beginning, um, please feel free to do that. We all have things that we are excited about. Yes, Richard Leganto is on that integrated list. That is something that we are working on right now, apparently. Um, next slide, please, Janet. And Janet, I think this is where I hand back to you. Yeah, that's right. Thanks so much, Nadia. I think that was a really helpful overview of the platform, what platform offers us. And as I said, there's lots more to come. So um, unless there's something that's really urgent that you'd like to still ask Nadia about, I'm going to move on to just explaining about the early access and the pilot courses. Is that all right? Anybody would like to um, ask Nadia anything? Um, I'm assuming I'm going to just get going then. Okay, so quite a few of you have already signed our form asking for early access and it's still available. We will be creating accounts for the, the people who ask for early access as a small group of people who can basically start playing around in personal sandbox course sites. So these, as Chanel explained, these will not be your courses or your course material. They'll be blank sandbox sites. And we will provide, as Shanali showed, some sample or demo courses for you to look at. But um, you know, the idea would be that you get a chance to play around with the sort of tools that Shanali has been explaining. So you can see what the power of this platform is and how you'd, you, know, you think it might work in your context. Then even, even if um, your course isn't scheduled for migration um, immediately coming up, we will be exploring the option of people starting to move their courses material in what we call a non-live migration um, later in the year. But we haven't set that date yet, but we will be letting you know when that's decided. So at the moment, from the 19th of, of April, uh, those who've signed up will get uh, login to um, to play around in the way that Shanali was describing to you. So what we just want to say to you 
we know we thought it was really useful to get people onto the platform getting to know it but it isn't completely finished with customization we like to be doing some bit of tweaking and in fact based on some of your experiences it might help us with some of the things we're wanting to refine and make really appropriate for our context so that, that's going to be you, know, you just have to be aware that it won't look identical maybe in a month or two to come so as i said you'll get an empty sandbox site uh, Shanali and our colleagues will be running a series of training for you to learn all the aspects that she's been explaining and we'll, we'll add you to the dedicated Teams channel where you can ask questions and share experiences and we'll monitor that but it will be um, part of like a growing community of us learning together because I think we're all learning as a new platform. So um, we just wanted you to be aware that there isn't, that's not the same thing as migration. Early access and migration are not the same thing. Early access is just what it is. It means you're getting a chance to look at the platform. And it's not about working on your own course. And we won't be putting you into the sort of formal migration process until we're clear when each uh, sort of type of course is scheduled for migration, which will come later. OK, so um, that's that's on the on the uh, early access. So I think Sam, have you shared the link for people who'd like to sign up? Or we'll put it into the chat later. So if you'd like to sign up still, there's still time to do that. And then you'll get notification of when you have access to the site, which will be from the 19th of April. And uh, Liani, I see you've raised your hand. Yes, thanks. Um, so I just want to make sure that I understood correctly. So if we sign up for this early part, is it? I, I'm I, I'm not even sure whether it's whether you're still looking for volunteers. I know my colleague Julia signed up, um, and I didn't. But just to be clear, so the people who are doing the pilot, will these students have access to the courses, and will it run like a normal course, or are you going to make a parallel course on? bright space but you're still running your actual course with students on vula that's, okay that's so part, yeah, no, thanks. part is um so what julia and i would love to do is to make a site for all of our alumni where we can share job opportunities with them and um share each other's successes with each other and just keep in contact with our alumni um, I'm not sure whether that would be a candidate for the pilot phase because it's not a course. It's a pro it would be in Vula, it would be a project site. Okay, so let me answer the second part first, uh, Liani, because we, we we want to focus on um, teaching, you know, courses that have got course codes, teaching courses first. So we wouldn't like to put that as part of the pilot set. That's the first question, you know, whether that'll be a possible use and how to set up late. We can look at that later. About your question around um, whether what what the pilots are. So this I've been talking about early access, which is just to give everybody a chance to play, literally to play around with the platform. The pilots we are currently in discussions with faculties about which courses we we could be put forward as a small group. We talk, we're talking about 30, 40 courses across the campus. They will give us a chance to sort of put the platform through its paces from in our context. And, there, and I'm going to talk about that next. So your colleague Julia has put her course forward from um, former media studies. And yeah, I think it's been uh, approved by the faculty. And there are quite a few issues to be considered and we'll look at that now. So maybe your question will be answered after the next question or two. But as long as you're done as early access, you will be able to flare around with the platform in the meantime. Okay, Liani. Thank you. Okay, so let's get on to what are the pilots. So the pilot's idea is that we do want to run some courses in the second semester that have that are being taught by you with students enrolled upon them. Okay, and we're busy in the process of consulting about which courses would make sense. So no one's going to be forced to do this, it's an opt-in. And the idea would be to trial the uses of the platform tools and affordances for the different contexts. That's why looking for a variety if we can. So we get a good you know, cross-section of types of courses and can evaluate the students and staff experiences and make necessary little adjustments where, where we, we can. But in part of selecting pilots, we need to really consider the experience of students and staff who are having to straddle or switch platforms. So that's why, in response to you, to you Liani, we need to just talk about who your, your where your course is located in the sort of student learning journey 
and you know maybe talk to your colleagues in your department and your faculty at what, whether it makes sense to pilot it so it's not like we look we're still looking for pilots but we do want them to be carefully selected so we're not you know causing disrupt disruption unnecessarily if there would be any so to continue about the pilot so we've asked each faculty to put forward some pilots and we have some already in the list uh, we generally don't think first year courses would be the most suitable, although we have got an exception in one instance, but generally speaking, we think it's probably better to leave first year students out of the, you know, like additional changes. We're looking for courses that kind of um, represent some essential or typical uses or, or tools that disciplines use, so we can sort of see how that um, functions in a teaching, like live teaching space. We're also looking for courses where staff are happy for us to be peering over their shoulder and helping and stuff like that. And we're thinking maybe it's useful if there's a team because then people can learn together and um, share the experience, but that's not essential and we will need departmental support. So this is an, a sort of further elaboration of some of the criteria looking at. So it's proposed that we don't do first year courses because we're hoping that they will be all migrated as one group so that students incoming in, in their first year will all be on the new platform, hopefully in 2023. Um, that we're saying for third and fourth year programs, it doesn't re it's better to not to put the final year students in this final semester onto a new platform because they're exiting anyway. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense for their experience. We are looking for some courses with a bit more reach, but we obviously don't want the largest classes that would be um, unnecessary, but something not, not only very tiny ones, although small courses are good pilots. And for courses that have got very complex course structure, we would be interested in looking at those. And if it, it feels like there's they need more time than to be getting ready by um, July 2022, we could put them as what we're calling non-live pilots, which is what you were saying, um, Liani, where you would build the course site, but you wouldn't teach on it yet. You would just start to construct it and put it in the way that you wanted on Brightspace. But that's not our priority, is really to look for some live pilots. Um, yeah, so we've said all, most of these things. We're thinking that uh, do we, you know, it would be good to have this signed off by the department and the faculty so that you get the support you need when you're doing this. Okay, so this is sort of the, the timeline we're going for, that in April, we, we collecting the um, pilots now during April, and we hope to have a complete list, say, around about Easter, and then possibly, if necessary, some additional courses, if we think that they're gaps by the end of the month, we'll be doing an audit of the sorts of elements that are on that on, on those courses. We we'll run some introductory sessions with the conveners who've signed up to be pilot conveners. We would do some prep on our side for the migration. And then we were probably going to migrate the, material, the course into a holding space on Brightspace. We would then look at the course site setup and we would sort of look at any snags around the migration. And meanwhile, the Brightspace training would be continuing. And then in June, uh, either in May or June, you know, the, you, the convener lecturers would access to the site to update, review, make changes, make up, make, you know, additional material res uh, onto the site. We would do some quality assurance and so would you. And they would look at making sure there's a student orientation module because anybody using this platform would obviously be new to it. So we have to make sure there's really good orientation materials so people know how to work with it. But we feel it's pretty intuitive as a you for a user, but we still want um, shortcut around making sure there's a good orientation uh, set of materials av available. And we'll be doing some user testing in the student role before the courses go live in July on the 25th of July, the beginning of the second semester. And then leading up to that, the launch of the, of the pilots, we'd look at training of any tutors that are necessary, uh, any sort of student support that we might need to be to have to be in place. And meanwhile, there'd be training continue and we'd make sure there's support for those of you teaching on the new platform as things go along. So that is the kind of timeline we're looking at. We think it's enough time to do what's necessary to get the courses ready, unless we just the course is very complex, and then we might move it into, as I said, a non-live um, pilot, where we would still be doing the construction and build, but we wouldn't put students on if we don't think it's quite ready. So, um, Shanali, I'm not. Uh, do you think there's anything I need to attend to in questions, or they've been handled? Has anybody got not questions? Seeing any questions right now directly about the pilot itself 
Um, and I do not see any hands or quiet unmutings. Great. Okay. We haven't, we're nearly at the end, so it's good. We can just get through the last few slides and then people can still keep posting questions in the chat and I'm sure my colleagues will be responding. So just now, so we were talking about the early access, which is people playing around with the platform and the pilot courses, which will be going to be the trial courses in the second semester of 2022. So that's still this year, but we also heading towards the migration of all our courses over the next two years or so. And I just wanted to say that our general approach is that we still we here to support you through the migration. We think that the, as you've seen from Shanali's demo, the Brightspace platform offers some really new, some nice new capabilities and some improvements in some of our existing um, functionality we have. While we, we may find there's some features you're currently using in Vula that are not directly equivalent, we can work with you to identify those and find solutions. That's part of what we're doing with the pilots to get a good cross section of courses. So we're looking at where we're going. And we think it's a great opportunity to um, adopt a more consistent approach to the course sites, which will benefit students and staff. So that's partly what's a what's informing our approach to migration. At the moment, we are in discussions with faculties about what makes most, most sense, but we're probably going to batch it, group in courses, and probably by level, which seems to make sense. So you would migrate all the first year courses so that all the students in first year are having that same experience and so on as we go along. But we need to look at all the levels of courses as well as the postgrad. So we have to still put that into a, a a locked down sort of um, timeline of when we'll do it, but most likely be like two waves a year, um, some sort of following semester pattern. So we work on courses for the semester in the semester before. We're hoping to complete this by February 2025. And as, as I've been saying, our expectation is to start with the first year courses for 2023 so that all incoming students have a common experience. But you know, even if your course is slated for later migration, you, know, you will be able to start playing around with it in the platform and getting it ready even before the actual live, go live state. And as we've been saying that Vula will be continuing to run the background and be fully supported by for anyone teaching on Vula or continue to teach on Vula. So the way, as I explained, the way we would do the actual course migration is that we would look at the, your course on, the, on Vula and do whatever preparation we need to do. We would migrate the material into a holding module. Then we could review that with you and the design and transfer it into the teaching ready course site, um, Brightspace um, site. So that's a real quick summary. We'll be providing more information about the migration process, the formal migration process, once we've gotten clarity from our discussions with the faculties and also get further you know, um, into the setup and detail. And then we'll, we'll certainly come back and have further sessions on how migration will work. So I think that's the end from us and it is five minutes to go. So I think it's if there's anything else you would like to ask about um, now, I think is the time. At least I haven't covered anything, Sam or Shanali, that you'd like to add on. Janet, I am seeing quite a lot of questions in the text chat that pertain to non-formal courses. So short courses and non-accredited courses. Can we just emphasize that for the first part of this process, we are focusing on formal accredited courses. We promise not to abandon the short courses. Um, as Stephen's saying, we have a work stream from the, for that, but trying to talk to all the different types of courses at the same time is very tricky because they have very different needs. Um, and so we will be picking up the short courses a little later. Please don't feel too abandoned. <laughs> In the meanwhile. Um, Gail, I think it's one of the things we looked at, when we, I believe, when the platform evaluation was being done is the ability to have different types of courses on one platform. So we think there's great potential for short courses. We're just not putting it at the very front of the process we're involved in, but it's definitely coming up, breathing on our, on our next coming up pretty soon. I'm not okay. I'm not seeing mm -hmm. any more. I'm not seeing any questions that are specifically migration or. 
Um, the question about what uh, deciding and when, when to, yeah. to migrate by year, mm -hmm. basically we're just trying to figure out, it's largely not so much to do with proficiency on Vula, but rather trying to look at what's going to be the least, uh, when the, the, the most smooth process for staff and students. Like, does it make sense for people to migrate a whole program or do it by level so that students are moving as they go through their career, coming onto the platform, you know, year by year. So we're, we're still trying to have that discussion with um, colleagues to and determine what's going to work best. But um, there's a few things to consider around that. We're interested in your perspective. I'd like to hear what you think as well. Um, Heidi's uh, asking about um, short courses. I think there's some yeah. other affordances that short courses offer. The short course configuration, Heidi, it has to do with like adding external participants, the pay gate functionality, if you need to, that sort of thing, which is quite different to what we have configured at the moment for the internal teaching sites but you'll be I think that we'll we, we will make sure that Anna chats to use I know you've got a lot of experience with the needs of short courses from your faculty so Janet with I think the other thing that we probably need to just close on or remind people of is that we are hoping to use Thursdays at 3 p.m as a regular update time so if you're, I mean, there will be other times as well, but keep an eye out for Thursdays at 3 p.m. for the next couple of weeks. Next week, we have a session on training. So next week's conversation is likely to be around um, what might the training for Brightspace look like? And we are very interested in hearing from staff on what, on the kind of proposed process for that. Um, so diarize the next three Thursday afternoons um, as possible spaces to hear more on this. Okay, folks, as a reminder, number one, if you have any more questions about Brightspace, please, 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 please go and add yourself to the teaching and learning team, uh, to the Brightspace, uh, and then you will have access to the Brightspace channel on that. We will definitely continue to respond to questions and uh, suggestions and ideas there. In that case, I would like to say a very big thank you to Janet um, for presenting today. Um, and thank you to Sam who worked with us in the background on this presentation. And a huge thank you to everyone from the SILT team who showed up, who've been answering flurries of questions in the text chat. Thank you very, very much to everybody who has joined us today. We appreciate your time and your energy and your efforts. Have a lovely rest of your day. And if we have missed your question in the text chat or we couldn't answer it fast enough or something like that, please, please, please add it to MS Teams and we promise we won't miss it there.